Thank you for joining us this week on Ask a Historian. I'm Matthew Wilkinson, historian with Heritage Mississauga. And this week we're going to explore some of the topics and stories around the First World War and Mississauga connections. Heritage Mississauga several years ago undertook a research project into uh, documenting the fallen soldiers of historic Mississauga, roughly dubbed Our Boys as, a, as an ongoing project. And uh, through that project, we identified 96 fallen soldiers who had served in the First World War and who did not come home, who were from historic Mississauga. The average age of those were, was a really young 23 years of age. Uh, in partnership with the Museums of Mississauga here in 2020, we, there will be hosted uh, an exhibit entitled Our Boys um, at the Anchorage at the Bradley Museum starting in September. And we're really looking forward to seeing the stories collected as part of the Our Boys Mississauga Remembers project uh, highlighted in a, in a fascinating exhibit through the Museums of Mississauga. Um, our boys will also feature on a uh, soon to come uh, virtual uh, war memorial, virtual war memorial through the website at Heritage Mississauga, where we will share the biographies um, and uh, information, archival sources, imagery that we have found for the 96 fallen soldiers from historic Mississauga who fell in the First World War. And a couple of weeks from now, we will actually be sharing some stories of those soldiers, uh, many of the soldiers anyways, that fell in the First World War. Uh, so just uh, fascinating topics associated with the, the soon to come Our Boys exhibit with the Museums of Mississauga. But also when we look at uh, topics of the First World War, some of the other things that jump into mind are, are things like Canada's first aerodrome located here in Lakeview. Um, uh, aspects of the home front, uh, what it was for, for life at home, uh, supporting those that went overseas. Um, and uh, even th uh, things on our landscape today that uh, harken back to those times of the First World War, uh, recently christened Vimy Park, where the Port Credit War Memorial, or the Port Credit Cenotaph, is located on State Bank Road, taking its, uh, uh, its uh, name recognition from a significant moment of time in the history of the First World War, but also in the history of Canada, uh, arguably when Canada stood up and identified as a, a nation. One of the commanding officers at the time said in those first few minutes on the advance at Vimy Ridge in April of 1917, he witnessed the birth of a nation. Uh, so the First World War has many ties uh, here at home in what is now the city of Mississauga, and not the least of which is the 96 young men who went overseas and did not return. Um, so we look forward to sharing those stories with you, uh, stories of the Our Boys exhibit, uh, uh, some questions that we receive, and examining uh, how we educate and talk about the First World War in our community today. So again, thank you for joining us on Ask a Historian and uh, exploring the topic of the First World War with us. Well, this week on Ask a Historian, uh, we're joined by Elizabeth Underhill, Supervisor of Museums and Education at the Museums of Mississauga. And there's a couple of exciting programs, uh, long anticipated, at least by us who work in the, in the field, but uh, very excited, first of all, to see these programs come to life, but also to see our world start to open up again and engage with, with the, the residents around us. And uh, Elizabeth uh, is, is going to come on and talk about those. So thank you, Elizabeth, for, uh, for joining us again. Um, and uh, uh, interesting days we know as we, you know, we go through the reopenings and uh, inviting the public back into our worlds. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm still at home. You're at the office. And, yeah. uh, um, you know, the world is slowly uh, reawakening, I guess. And, uh, a couple of really exciting initiatives at the Museums of Mississauga to kind of welcome people back in or back out, I guess, maybe the, uh, the, the proper term. But uh, um, first one, Our Boys, um, and uh, a subject near and dear to my heart for, for many years, and I'm so excited to see what the museums have been able to do with that program. Uh, wondering if you can uh, kind of introduce the subject and, 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 and talk about what, uh, what, what people can expect. Yeah, so thanks for having me back. Um, always so happy to chat with you, Matthew, and, and Heritage Mississauga. Uh, so Our Boys is uh, an exhibition that we will be opening at the Bradley Museum on September 3rd, and it goes until January 10th, 2021. Uh, and it comes from primarily the research that you and Heritage Mississauga did about 
um, the fallen soldiers in the First World War who had enlisted from Mississauga. Um, so these are sometimes very young men um, and others who had uh, enlisted from the different villages in Toronto Township. So uh, Streetsville, Port Credit, things like that. Um, and they're the ones who, who paid the ultimate sacrifice um, for our rights and freedoms that we get to enjoy as Canadians. So uh, we are sharing profiles of some of those young fallen soldiers at the Bradley Museum and um, just taking a closer look at what was happening um, in Mississauga and in Canada in World War I and the I, different I, sacrifices people made, yeah. And it's such a, a it's a powerful uh, thought, I guess. And uh, there, there is a question coming, so just bear with me. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, you know, to, to, to start it out many years ago as a research project with the, with the idea of saying, okay, who were our fallen? Um, and can we remember them? Because largely from history, we have not um, mm -hmm. until arguably now. Um, and then to uncover photographs of the individuals to put faces to names. Um, and then it's one thing to see it as kind of computer documents and, uh, you know, collected material, but then uh, to see the graphic that has been able to be produced for this, um, and 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 hopefully we'll share some here yes. uh, in, in this program as well, so people can see what I'm what I'm referring to. It's a powerful statement. It's it's beautifully done, um, but it, it's 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 powerful to see the remembrance as a visual element, and and to think that we are are fulfilling that obligation, if you will. Uh, and so kudos to the, to the museum's team for, mm -hmm. for bringing that really to life and, you know, taking the research and communicating in a different fashion. And I think it's a beautiful statement and so happy to be a very small part of that and, and uh, excited to see people engage with these parts of our stories. Because you said, this is the youth of our community. They were. Um, the, the average age, I think, was about 23 years of age. Uh, one in nine Mississauga soldiers did not return home. Uh, Ninety-six yeah. fallen. Um, it, yeah. it, it's a telling story, and and uh, you know the cenotaphs only capture a portion of that. Um, and, and to see it, or yeah. haven't seen it in full yet, but to, to see what it what it what the artwork entails, and I encourage everyone to come out. Uh, so, uh, you're the the base of operations, or the, the the showcase primarily is at the Anchorage at the Bradley Museum. Uh, That's right, yeah. But you have other locations as well that you can engage with the story? Yeah, we do. So um, at the Bradley Museum, um, people can come um, starting the week of September 14th. You'll be able to come up and just ring the doorbell if you want to come in to the museum um, to have a walk through the exhibition. Because of COVID safety precautions, we can only have 10 people uh, from the public in the building at a time and we need to do the screening questions make sure people have their masks on uh, things like that so the door will will be closed but just ring the doorbell during our public hours and, and we'll be letting people in to come see it and your public hours are sorry the public hours starting the week of September 14th are Thursday to Sunday 12 to 4 okay yeah um, so people can drop by uh, for that. And then we also are showing um, a little satellite exhibition at the Veneri's uh, Visitor Center. Um, we have um, one of our museum's collections assistants uh, is a curator at the um, Orlinski Museum, which focuses on um, Polish North American soldiers who volunteered uh, for the war as well. And so we have a little spin-off exhibition there focusing on some of those men. Um, yeah. And then also um, the Peel Art Gallery Museums and Archives have pulled together a bit of research from their archives about uh, the men in Peel region who were among the fallen in the First World War. And so they'll be putting on um, uh, displaying a few of those profiles as well. But um, PAMA is reopening this fall uh, dates are TBD, so we're just kind of keeping an eye on their website um, and with their staff for more information about that. But well, the, the nice thing about it, if, if we can, can, I guess you know, you always look for silver, silver lining in the, yeah. in the dark cloud. Um, the exhibit runs into January tenth, I believe you said. So yep. 
we've got a, a long period of time here as we, you know, we all collectively slowly reopen in some fashion that we can engage with this in, in different elements over, over the course of this time. So, um, but, but I encourage anyone to go and see it. It is, it is uh, uh, well worth uh, yeah. spending time and remembering. It's very, it's very powerful, um, I think. And there's a lot to kind of discover with the exhibition as well. Like, as you said, with those cenotaphs, you see the names, but you don't fully understand like the, the impact or the loss on the community. I mean, people in my generation maybe don't, or people who maybe haven't studied history so closely. Um, it's, it's hard to really um, picture what happened. Um, but like you said before, you've been able to find some photographs of some of these fallen soldiers. Uh, was it 30 that you I think saw? we're around 35 to 38 photographs of, yeah. of the 96 fallen. Yeah. Of the 96 fallen. Yeah. So we have some of those photos and they're even like sometimes really tiny because. Some of them are tiny crops out of a newspaper. <laughs> yeah. And, and I know you've said before, you know, some of these boys, before I kind of stumbled because I was saying young men and others, but I was really like, it's like just flabbergasting how young yeah. they were kids. Um, there were some, some men who volunteered who were in their fifties, maybe not from Mississauga, but yeah. I did read about that. There as was well. one from Mississauga that was in his fifties. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, let me in. Um, but yeah, it's just to see those photos and the baby faces. I mean, we have a, a picture of, um, Edgerton Sayers, who uh, we we look at at the Benares Historic House quite a bit, um, and he's just this beautiful baby-faced young man. Um, so sad. So, yeah. In, in some of the stories of loss, and and uh, I, we won't dwell too much on this, just to <laughs> give a segue for, in a couple of weeks' time, we're going to be back on Ask a Story and also looking at some First World War material, and we'll 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 highlight that a little bit later on but during that episode i'm actually going to be focusing on some stories of fallen soldiers so we won't mm -hmm. spend a lot of time on that on, on this week's episode but uh, uh i know one of your posters and it's the one that that strikes at my heart the, the most is that of the whitehead brothers um mm -hmm. three siblings from malton all of one family all fall in the first world war um, to make matters worse from our research um uh, by 1921 that entire family is gone um, the, uh, one of the, uh, the, uh, the youngest daughter, the, the, the surviving ch child, which was a girl, uh, she passed away early into a marriage and we don't know if it was mm -hmm. childbirth or whatnot, but she, she passed away. And then both parents, one dies in 1920, one dies in 1921. And so you, you literally have, uh, within, uh, I think the first son passes away in 1916, uh, I believe from memory. Um, so within a, you know, a five year span, a family is gone. Um, and you know, three of them, what heartbreaking news from a family and yeah. the, never mind, you know, the community as well, but a family. And, and that's where I think the, there's a power to the exhibit that we're doing from a remembrance perspective. Mm. Um, you know, there's a, the, uh, I'll probably butcher the words a little bit, but you know, from these failing hands, we throw the torch, be it yours to hold it high. Um, I'd yeah. argue, you know, you know, perhaps somewhat ashamedly, but as, as a historian, we didn't hold it high for a period of time. And I, I think we are trying right. to do that now. And, right. and, um, it is well worth that uh, remembering the paths which we've walked um, yeah. and, and those that uh, were of this community um, and may yet may have had an impact on the shape of things to come in Mississauga and never got that chance. Um, yeah. in, in, and so it's, it's a powerful statement, I think. Uh, so yeah. you, you're doing, uh, I've talked too much on this part. <laughs> uh, you, you're doing you're doing um, programming around this. I mean, we've got yeah. several months ahead of us, but could you highlight some of the programs that you're you're bringing in? Yeah. So um, um, one of the um, things that we kind of noted with the, the all these young men who were enlisting from Mississauga um, and who um, you know were so grateful. For their sacrifice, um, but they were like 99.9% .9 um, white families, and that were that were enlisting in this area, which is that's fine. <laughs> that's the way it was at the time. It was um, predominantly very white community, um, but we realized this isn't this isn't telling 
all of Canada's story. You know, Canadians are not just at that time, just from, from white backgrounds. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we were also respecting and recognizing the other Canadians from different backgrounds um, across the country who did also pay that ultimate sacrifice. So we have speakers who are coming in to talk about, for example, the, um, the Sikh, Canadi Sikh Canadians who were able to volunteer um, and saw combat overseas. Um, we are going to have uh, speakers talk about um, Black Canadians who um, did manage to enlist, even though there were um, different <laughs> attitudes at the time about keeping people segregated or not having white soldiers mingling with Black soldiers. But um, we know that there was the, the number two construction battalion that, um, that was raised in Nova Scotia. But we know that there were like between, some people estimate between 1,000 and 2,000 Black Canadians who actually saw active combat overseas. Um, so we'll, we'll be looking at that. Um, and I'll give you the specifics as well yeah, um, for those, those things. And then the other one that I wanted to mention was also talking about um, First Nations uh, soldiers and veterans. So um, we will have Darren Waibenga, who is a librarian and historian from the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, presenting a talk about some of the veterans from the Mississaugas of the Credit, um, one of whom was Cameron Brandt, um, which you think is a Six Nations think, name, yeah. but his family actually did uh, become part of the Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, and he has a couple artifacts of uh, Cameron's that he will share. So um, it's, it's just meant to, yeah, really give the fuller picture of, well, hey, why is this a room full of, you know, <laughs> nice looking young white men? Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about where they, where people were living and where they were able to actually enlist at the time. So and that's a powerful conversation to have. You, you, uh, and and I applaud you for that because, uh, in a way, having a, an exhibit that focuses solely on Mississauga soldiers, as we probably should, it's it's our community, yeah. and uh, we're remembering that. But it it opens the door to a wider conversation of Canadiana and and uh, uh, Canadian consciousness. We, we you know the, the society that we're engaging with today. Uh, there's no singular root, and, and uh, in terms of their own ancestry, their own culture, and whatnot, uh, that is Mississauga today. Um, and so you know, bringing us into that wider Canadian conversation um, and, and, and beyond. I mean, uh, uh, many people who are connected to the First World War came after. Um, yes. And, and uh, you know, what are their stories? What are their connections? I always, uh, there, there's a fun story, just a really quick one, on the very first name on our fallen that we found from a date perspective is on the honor roll in St. Peter's uh, Anglican Church in Arendelle, and his name's Franklin Sturch. Uh, and <laughs> fell just before Christmas in 1914. Well, the big challenge was Canadian troops weren't on the ground in 1914. Thank you. Uh, yeah. And, and so, so how did a fellow get a, on, a, on a, a war memorial in Mississauga when huh. he obviously, well, as best we could tell, was, wasn't here? Yes. <laughs> and, yes. Uh, uh, we were able to trace that his family came in 1926 and the honor roll was created in 1928. Uh, and they put his son's name on. He was a British soldier. He'd never come to uh. Canada. Um, yeah. So the world shrinks at times. It's smaller than we think it is, and, and borders are borders are arbitrary things. Um, yes, people travel. Uh, I, I always say news traveled. It might have traveled more <laughs> slowly than it does. But people and news still traveled, and uh, I, you know, it's a fascinating way to have those conversations, those bigger picture conversations. And um, I, I, yeah. I that, that, that had to be a challenge to put together too, from a perspective point of view. But uh, yeah. And, and you see as well, like how much it means to families to have that recognition in their community that, hey, there was someone from my family who, who paid the ultimate price. Um, and, and there's the loss, but there's also the pride and the patriotism that goes along with that. And you see that in some of these uh, stories about, um, uh, you know, at the time, they would have been... Uh, visible minorities, which we don't, we don't really say anymore because 
it's not <laughs> not a minority, but people of color, you can see the lengths that people of color at the time in the First World War went to be part of this um, and and to contribute and to sort of stand up and prove to Canadians that, hey, we're just as like equal. We're equal citizens. We deserve the same rights as white Canadians. We deserve the same, um, uh, you know, the... <laughs> This is maybe a place to pause in the <laughs> editing, but um, it's just, it's kind of overwhelming because uh, it's been a lot of new information um, for me personally to kind of sort of dive into and to read, just the read about the lengths that people went to just to serve overseas and to want to contribute to Canada and be seen as equal citizens to everyone else. And, and that's um, something we should remember and celebrate entirely. I would think that, that drive to, to a call to duty uh, in there in, and to realize that there are barriers in place yeah. that prevented that um, or, or sought to prevent that, at least in the, certainly the beginning years of the war. Um, yeah, especially around um, like disenfranchisement, certain like Chinese Canadians, um, Sikh Canadians didn't have the right to vote um, but they could be taxed. So part of, I think, trying to enlist was to show, hey, like we, <laughs> we deserve the same rights as everybody else. We're doing a lot to help build this country. We want to be here um, as British subjects in, in many cases as well um, to there, there's, enjoy uh, the same rights and privileges. So Sometimes it's, um, it's difficult to come to terms with things that we think only happened elsewhere happened here. And, and uh, in terms of those uh, barriers that were put up, I, it, it seems to be the politest word I can think of at the moment. And, yeah. um, and uh, you know, that really blocked the path to citizenship. Um, and, uh, you know, we can be appalled by it now, but it's also a time to learn from that and learn, the, again, the paths that we've walked and, and how we've gotten to where we are. And uh, we aren't at the finish line by any stretch. I'm not, not saying exactly. that at all, but... This, this opens the, the door for a, a further conversation. And I'm looking forward to that because I know that the programming is approaching from different angles and, and, and different themes, but um, it involves the opportunity to have multiple conversations. And I think that's, that, that's a brilliant uh, aspect. So how do people engage with the program? <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> nice segue. <laughs> I brought it right back there. <laughs> um, so... Um, because again of COVID-19 and um, some of our speakers not being local um, and a lot of the programming happening in the winter, I'm thinking of Darren trying to drive from Hagersville to Mississauga in the middle of November that, ugh, in the snow. Um, we're presenting most of the programs online. Um, so uh, Darren's talk will be Saturday, November 14th. And you can find out about that on our website. It is um, mississaugaculture.ca slash warflowers. We also are so thrilled to have um, the author, Lawrence Hill, uh, presenting a, a talk on his current research and his current novel um, in conversation with Natasha Henry, who is the president of the Ontario Black History Society. So they will be delving more into the story of the um, Black Canadian diaspora in Canada. So how people spread out, why they settled where they did, um, and the contributions of uh, African-American soldiers in the Second World War who were here in Canada building the Alaska Highway. Uh, in the far north. So that's sort of what Lawrence Hill's research and writing centers around right now is he's um, exploring that history. His father is a, a World War II veteran um, and was also coincidentally one of the founders of the Ontario Black History Society. So that's going to be a conversation between him and Natasha, but again, it's online. It's Friday, November 6th. We are presenting that in partnership with the Mississauga Library. And so people will be able to submit their questions um, to Lawrence and Natasha through that, that online event. And to, to access these are through the culture website, the museum's website through culture? Okay. That's right. And you can also find them on Eventbrite. Yeah. <laughs> so to register for them, um, you will have to go on to Eventbrite and register for those talks. And they're free, free admission in terms of- Got it. Yep. We, 
we're very fortunate to get um, funding support for this from the um, from Veterans Affairs. Um, we have a lovely sponsorship from our wonderful friends of the Museums of Mississauga, who received a grant from the Community Foundation of Mississauga. Um, and we, we also got a grant from Canadian Heritage. So these things make it all possible. I, I was going to say, and, and, and it's a wonderful way to engage and, uh, you know, hopefully we can, uh, through us at Heritage Mississauga, we'll help promote and draw people to it as well, because I think it's such a, uh, an important conversation to have and, and at any time, but certainly at this time as well, um, uh, of what we see around in the world around us. And uh, uh, yeah. so you, uh, I don't know if this is quite as a smooth segue, if you will, but uh, you mentioned the website is uh, a slash war flowers. And that brings yes. us to uh, uh, a second part of uh, yes. exciting exhibits that are happening going on. And uh, so our boys, again, at the Anchorage, at the Bradley Museum, then also satellite exhibits at uh, the, the Benares Historic House and up at PAMA as well. Um, and anyone following us with Heritage Mississauga will also be pushing that through our social media channels to, to raise awareness for it. Um, um, but uh, not quite simultaneously at the, at the beginning, but <laughs> running concurrently for a period of time uh, is another exciting exhibit that the Museum of Mississauga are bringing to Mississauga. And this one is hosted at the Living Arts Center mm -hmm. um, entitled War Flowers. I'm wondering yes. if you can tell us just a little bit about War Flowers. Just a smidge. So um, War Flowers is a touring art exhibition that originated in Quebec um, at the Jardin de Mitty or Reford Gardens. And it focuses on the stories of 10 different Canadians in the First World War. Um, and uh, kind of looks at those Canadians and what they went through and ties it into more universal themes of the human experience of war. Um, and it's this really um, beautiful uh, sensory experience. So um, I've got my little mask on, everything, you'll be able to go through it with a mask, but we've got some nice little, um, pieces of it that you can still enjoy with your senses. So um, the title War Flowers comes from um, letters that a soldier named George Cantley, Stephen George Cantley, sent back home to his baby daughter in Montreal during the First World Wars from, from Europe. And as he traveled throughout Europe, um, he, I think, tried to write a letter every day and he would pick a flower from wherever he was and he sent that back to his baby daughter. Um, so alongside these portraits of the 10 Canadians, um, there are um, perfume stations set up um, that a perfume artist has developed um, to try to uh, express some of these, these universal truths or themes that come out in times of war. So uh, one of them, for example, is a mother's love, right? That's, uh, you can't always have to remember our moms um, and what this does to them as well. Um, and then there are crystal sculptures made of the different flowers. And you can see images of these pressed flowers that were kept and passed on through the years. So um, that is, it's a, it's a big touring exhibition. Uh, it's been to Vimy. Uh, it's been to Ottawa. It was, it's in Edmonton right now. It's being shipped <laughs> to Mississauga. And this will be the last place that you'll be able to see this exhibition is here in Mississauga. Um, so because we had that, that story and just this really amazing sensory um, exhibition about Canadians in the First World War, we thought this is a great opportunity to showcase now our boys, the fallen from Mississauga um, and, and bring that sort of more personal local connection to it. So. And let, I mean, obviously from a theme First World War, but such a, a powerful uh, conversation of remembrance. It, it, it will be fascinating come Remembrance Day this year to have this kind of programming in our city at that time. Uh, I, I suspect we might have a rush. I don't know if we'll be able to handle a rush. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, uh, What are the dates for War Flowers? Uh, it's September 17th to December 13th. Yeah. Uh, so it's open Wednesday through Sunday at the Living Arts Centre, 12 to 4 p.m. Um, you can book your tickets uh, online for that. They will be up through the Living Arts Center's box office. Um, and 
it's best to try to book it in advance because it's timed entry to the exhibition. So um, only four people from the same social circle can go into the exhibition at a time. And we have it spaced out kind of every 15 minutes. Um, and so there's, so there's that piece of it. You can, you can go in, you can book in advance to make sure you get the time slot that you want. But if you're just in the area anyways, um, you can also take your chances and go to the Living Arts Center and see if you can get a ticket on the spot. So. Now the tickets themselves for this, is it also a free event or is this one that they do? It is free. Excellent. It is free as well. Yes. Um, and um, the, and 12 to 4 Wednesday to Sunday, you said? Yep. <laughs> Um, so, so I mean, there are two wonderful opportunities to be out and about and to, to see some culture uh, firsthand and to, you know, re-engage with uh, the passionate people in the, in the cultural industry here in Mississauga, the museums in Mississauga, uh, explore our local history together. And um, from that, I, I mean, the museums itself offer uh, experiences beyond our boys and more flowers. And uh, uh, I don't know if it's <laughs> like to say you're coming back to life, you haven't really stopped but but we're, we're opening the doors again um yeah. uh, what can how, how can people engage with museums in general and and uh, and what's happening with the museums outside of these yeah. two amazing things yeah thank you so um always visit us online mississaugaculture.ca to find out more about what the museums are doing if you would like to come for a visit of um, either the Benares Historic House or the Bradley Museum, we are booking tours in advance for that as well. Um, so you can go to our website and book your tickets, um, or you can give us a call. Um, our lines are open. 905-615-4860. Um, and extension 2110. And um, we can take your booking over the phone and just with the, the guided tours at our buildings. Um, again, we do have the limited attendance only um, and time tours. So unfortunately, we can't accommodate uh, walk up visitors right now um, at this phase, but um, we can take up to 10 people in the same social circle on a tour at once. So. And are you yeah. starting to develop plans for uh, programming? I know we talked about online programming with the exhibits that are that are coming up, but um, just you know, museums programming. And I didn't I didn't you know uh, warn you on that question. That's okay. Yet, <laughs> but I uh, just just wondering what uh, I mean. The museums offer wonderful programming, and I know we're having our challenges at Heritage Mississauga how to reengage with with our programming as well. So just curious what the museums are doing for for their normal programming. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's it's changed so much right like we're having to reinvent ourselves and and we're seeing what our amazing colleagues and, and partners have been able to do as well and we're trying to just keep an eye on what's happening out there so um we are looking at doing um something for halloween <laughs> i don't want to let the cat out of the bag just yet but um, we are cat. looking at, <laughs> <laughs> of course we love cats at the museums. Everyone knows that it's a fact, um, but we're looking at doing maybe something in person for <clears throat> Halloween. Normally we would do our um, fantastic piece of Benary's Halloween event, um, but this year we're not. So starting to reimagine that um, we're also offering some, online programming again through the library. It's called Open Museum. So you can learn about the agricultural history of Mississauga. You can learn about the lost art of letter writing. Um, and there are a couple more workshops that we have planned as well. Um, and so that's free online programming that will be happening once a month starting in September um, through the Mississauga Library. And so it's a UX, you, public accesses it through the library website? Yep, through the library website, they register there, um, and we will pop up on your screen, kind of like this, and uh, share a presentation. Excellent. And it, it can be interactive as well, so we'll have people able to ask questions of our staff and, and learn more about Mississauga's history that way. Well, great, great job, and uh, uh, you know, it, the world is changing even as we make plans, and uh, um, I, I wish you and the staff well. I, I know you've got lots of uh, ideas, and uh, <laughs> you know, this is one step towards that to return to some sort of normalcy with the exhibits that are opening, and it's exciting to see and hear, and uh, 
uh, again, just you know, my own thought. You know, uh, thank thank you for inviting us into your world, and and uh, <laughs> it, it's it's a, an honor and a privilege to be even a small part of it, and and oh. um, and really look forward to seeing it up. Uh, I'll I'll come down and see see uh, both uh, our boys and our flower. Uh, our flowers are war flowers <laughs> um, and uh, really look forward to exploring uh, th that story brought to life or those stories brought to life and uh, and uh, having those conversations in the wider community and uh, hopefully there's a resonance there and again welcoming uh, welcoming people back to museums maybe not with open arms but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's socially distance it's social arms, distance, physically yeah, distance yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. we're hugging their friends for ear hugs from a distance the other day oh, okay air hugs um, yeah. the um, uh, but it was just you know welcoming people back and and, uh, and sharing the, the wonderful stories of this place and uh, thank you uh, for your time to spend with us and uh, and for all the work that you do and have done and whatever the right way to say that is. Uh, Why are you thanking me, Matthew? <laughs> like this is all your research that this is coming out of. So thank you. But you yeah. know your team there, um, Megan and Stephanie and uh, Lindsay and so yeah. many others uh, that are yeah. working so diligently at the museums. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for that to them and and hopefully the, the, you'll have a good turnout for people coming out to see uh, our boys and our and war flowers um and in a couple of weeks from now we'll be back on to talk a little bit more in depth about war flowers yes. and uh, and some of the other things that are going on so thank yeah, you yeah you might be stuck with me again because megan and Lindsay and stephanie are all busy bees installing the actual exhibitions doing all that uh, that work so um to be honest we'll, they're, they're, we'll just get them on. they're just camera shy aren't they <laughs> well i mean i am too <laughs> but yeah no they're very they're very busy with that so we'll get we'll get them on eventually yeah. maybe maybe we can do a live taping at one of the uh one of the shows maybe we can coordinate with that but we'll figure that out as we go but yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're learning with this program too. So, <laughs> yeah, no, this is a wonderful opportunity for the museum. So, thank you for sharing your platform with us and and helping us get the word out to the community. I always get a note after from one or two people saying, "Oh, I saw you on Ask a Historian," and <laughs> it, it's 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 <laughs> it's becoming a, a, it's, it's a really fun thing to do. And I hope from our, our public perspective too, because again, we'll we'll be watching this uh, part of our program. Send in your questions. Uh, if there's anything that uh, you're interested in our boys or in more flowers or from the museums in general, uh, again, we'll have Elizabeth on in a, in a couple of weeks time again. And, uh, you know, this is an opportunity to, to engage in other ways. And uh, uh, you use this, uh, use this platform, use this, uh, this program as a way to communicate. So anyone with questions that's watching this, please send your questions in and uh, we look forward to exploring them with you. And uh, uh, it's always fun to, to walk down uh, the culture street, if you will, and uh, uh, see what's see what's happening in our community. And it's wonderful to see it coming back to life. Uh, yeah. And, um, so with that, Elizabeth, thank you, um, and uh, we'll talk to you again in a, in a couple of weeks. And by then, our boys will be done, and more flowers on the horizon. So it's uh, and then on to the next one. On to the next, and on to the next, <laughs> and, and and it's a good way to it, it. It's a good feeling to be talking about the next. I think it's. <laughs> Oh, we have, we, yeah, we've got a long, long vision ahead. So that'll well, that's, be good. that's excellent to have. It's excellent. Yeah. To have. Well, this week on Ask a Historian, we're joined once again by Greg Carrero, uh, Vice President of Heritage Mississauga, but also a, uh, a high school teacher with the uh, Defram Peel uh, Catholic District School Board, and uh, also a renowned history teacher, and yes, I'm not afraid to say that. Uh, quite a few comments over time from past students and uh, current students of, of uh, the work that you put in the classroom, and I know the passion in which you engage with local history. So thank you for, for joining us once again here on, on Ask a Historian, Greg. Um, and uh, our, our theme this week is on the First World War and uh, particularly the, the local connections and the Canadian connections to the First World War. And I know the subject is near and dear to your heart. And I'm wondering if we can jump right in uh, to uh, two feet. It's such a broad topic. There's so much to talk about. We can't hope to cover all aspects of it. Uh, we may just allude to some things and we have some questions later on from, from audience as well. But uh, just the beginning of the war, particularly from the Canadian perspective, um, 
you as a historian, I'm wondering if you can kind of share your knowledge, your passion of uh, the subject of the First World War with us and start, let's start from August 4th of, uh, of, of 1914 and uh, see, where, see where our conversation goes. Okay. Can I, well, okay. Uh, I'll try. August 4th is good. I can really quickly to go back just Absolutely. slightly, um, just for context, you know, we're looking at a, a country that became a uh, a nation in 1867, but really had very limited, in fact, hardly any international uh, experience uh, prior to this First World War, uh, with the exception, of course, of the Boer War in 1900. So, um, you know, this war presented uh, Canada with um, a challenge as far as uh, becoming an adult is concerned. Uh, so this was an opportunity for Canada, in my mind, to pay back the motherland uh, for all that it had done for for the the young nation of Canada, and I say that um, it, with full knowledge that Canada was a uh, predominantly uh, well, it was definitely politically and socially and politically uh, economically dominated by the uh, by the English, the upper, upper class, aristocracies of, of, of England and whatnot. So um, there's there was a loyalty, and also the the just prior to the war, there was a very large influx of immigrants coming from England, working class English coming to uh, Canada. And so with, with that sort of kind of uh, demographic in the country, it, it was uh, it was absolutely, um, in, in most Canadians' minds, uh, I, I, well, it was a no-brainer that they would have to uh, support the motherland in all, in all means, by all means. If, uh, one of the things, you just to parallel what, you're, what you've said there, and uh, um, Several years ago, we undertook research, which we, which we dubbed Our Boys, uh, look at Mississauga's uh, uh, soldiers from the First World War, particularly those that fell. Uh, and in doing that, uh, identifying 96 fallen soldiers from historic Mississauga who served in the First World War, um, the va a, a large portion of them born in England. Um, and uh, most of them, obviously, they're, they're living in, in Canada at the time that the First World War comes about, and they enlist with the Canadian Expeditionary Force. But again, there's a good portion of them uh, having been born in England, and some of them only being in Canada for a few years uh, prior to the First War. Um, and so, you know, you try to reach out when we're doing the biographies of soldiers, you try to reach out and make these connections to the place in which the, you've got uh, a, a soldier by the name of Devlin uh, from Arendale who uh, you, you try to make that connection. Well, he, had, he really, other than the fact that he was here for about a year and a half prior to the war, he left no tangible evidence behind of his existence at this place because he didn't have those connections. He didn't make those, those personal connections that we found. Didn't, you know, and that's just a, a one example. So you're, you're talking about, I guess, Canada very much tied to Britain uh, in, in every sense, social, economic, political. Um, and dependent it? in many ways, still quite dependent, of course. Um, when, uh, when the United Kingdom declares war, Canada automatically uh, must answer the call. So it's not even a choice for Canada at this point. And, and you know, as I said before, it's not really uh, too great a problem for most Canadians. Politically, there's some, some resistance, but, um, but from your average Canadian who is still kind of experiencing the glory days of uh, Britannia when, you know, the, the empire was at its largest, you know, this was uh, something of great pride to be able to participate in this great English, um, for want of a better word, crusade uh, against the, the villains from Germany. And so, um, so when you look at the fact that um, so many Canadians are, are newly arrived to the country from the United Kingdom and, you know, the entire British Empire still is um, kind of puffing out its chest about its dominance. I mean, it's it's quite easy to see how the patriotic fervor uh, would run high, not just in Canada, but across the entire empire. Um, and in fact, you know, they had to limit the number of, um, of recruits uh, at the beginning of the war because they were just signing up too fast to process. So that there was definitely no, no recruitment problem at the outset of the war. I, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, I, I know I, I suggested approaching this kind of as a timeline, but just on the subject of recruitment, uh, we'll, we'll maybe bounce around the different aspects of the First World War, but volunteerism and patriotism uh, were, were rampant at the beginning. I mean, we're, 
1914, when war is declared, we're still very much within the shadow of the Victorian Empire, and and your, as you said, rural Britannia. Um, and, you know, those, those those dreams, in a way, become shattered as the First World War, uh, or those concepts become shattered a bit or reworked as the First World War progresses. Um, but recruitment itself, how did how did it evolve over the course of the course of the war? Um, well, we didn't have, you know, uh, again, the Boer War aside, and that was a bit of an exceptional experience. We didn't really have a professional standing army. So when, uh, when the drums of war were sounding, uh, the task fell upon a uh, self-appointed colonel uh, in the, uh, the cabinet and the government uh, named uh, Sam Hughes to create, uh, a, for want of a better word, a professional force. And, um, you know, as I said before, there was such a, a rush to join up that the army could afford to be discriminating as far as who they accepted. It, you know, there's that old kind of belief that the army would accept anybody with two front teeth and, and, and a trigger finger. But in fact, uh, the standards were a little bit higher than that. Um, even prior to the use of, of poison gases and whatnot, Canadian recruitment uh, did require you to be uh, free of any sort of um, uh, uh, issues such as uh, asthma or any sort of bronchial uh, issues that you may have. And, and so you'd be surprised the number of men that were actually turned away. I mean, even in the beginning of the war, um, they were ideally looking for single men, unmarried men. Right. And, um, you know, the age they were at the beginning of the war, quite adamant that they had men um, over the age of 18, 19 to be able to serve. So, um, yeah, and the recruiting offices were everywhere. They they were set up in small towns across the country. Um, and, and at the beginning of the war, as I keep on saying, they needed to rely on nothing more than patriotic fervor for the most part. That being said, uh, when I speak to my students about this war and about why men would have wanted to join, I, I also want to look at other possibilities because, you know, there were non-English uh, men who signed up, including in Quebec. Uh, who volunteered and um, they had their own motivations whether it was um, you know if you're a, someone working in the nickel mines up in uh, Sudbury uh, perhaps you wanted a holiday a break from that dangerous work I, I know that sounds flippant to say but they have had some I've seen some letters in which uh, Canadian soldiers remarked on the uh, the rather comfortable conditions of being at the front versus their their jobs back home in Canada <laughs> you know, lumberjacks, miners, working as fishermen, um, where, where, where death was an injury was commonplace. Um, but even others who were unemployed, this was a job. It was strictly a job. It was uh, food, it was clothing, it was pay. So there were a lot of motivations for these uh, men to join beyond patriotic forever. I don't wanna kind of make it so simple as that, though that was the, the overwhelming driving factor for sure. And um, again, recruitment, uh, will change in nature as the war progresses and requirements will change. But at the very beginning, it was uh, remarkably easy. There's fabulous images of uh, new recruits uh, drilling and preparing to move off to uh, Valcarce and, and off to uh, England uh, at the CNE grounds, which was converted to a, a military barracks. I guess and, uh, I'll do a bad segue here. As we're talking, I'll show some imagery of uh, recruits in, in historic Mississauga as well, because we have those images as well. Nothing well, quite like seeing uh, a troop of uh, First World War soldiers in uniform marching along Dundas Street. Uh, I was going to say, um, T.L. Kennedy, uh, Thomas Kennedy had uh, a, a cavalry unit, uh, a mounted unit at the beginning of the war, I believe. And uh, he paraded his, uh, his men quite proudly in what is today downtown Cooksville at, at Dundas and Ontario. So yeah. I'll show a picture of that as well. Um, the uh, One of the things I wanted to touch on, just in case we don't come back to it, because uh, we have a broad ranging uh, subject here today. Um, one of the neat things about uh, recruitment is seeing the evolution of, of propaganda. Um, and at the beginning of the war, you see a lot of patriotic things about uh, doing your duty and a call to duty and supporting Mother Britain and you know, appealing to kind of that, that adventure sense, if you will, and the, the patriotic uh, uh, fervor. Uh, later in the war, there's a little bit more of kind of convincing or guilting people into following. Um, and then, of course, uh, and I wanted to touch on this, but in, uh, in 1917, uh, you, uh, you know, the conscription crisis that ends with the Military Services Act. Um, I'm wondering if you can, if you can touch on, on that as a, as a social thing within, within, uh, within Canada. 
in terms of how the nature for recruiting changes over the course of the war? Sure. I mean, we're pretty much focusing on 1917 at this point, which is a, a really crucial year in, in my mind for the entire war, both in Canada and abroad. Um, you know, you said it correctly, in the beginning of the war, there was a lot of um, posters, uh, recruitment posters that had the Union Jack and the Lion and the Beaver side by side and whatnot. As the war progresses and resistance to, um, to join uh, grows, you start seeing what you said before, the guilt uh, and, and also the vengeance uh, start appearing in the, the propaganda, whether it's uh, depicting German soldiers as guerrillas with a bloody club in one hand and a woman half naked in the other, uh, saying, do you want this to happen to you? Now that's an American poster, but we had similar ones. Um, and then the, the, the famous one where the, the father is sitting down with his children and his boy is playing with little toy soldiers. His daughter is reading, a, I guess, what would be a history book. And she looks up and asks him, what did you do, daddy, during the Great War? And he kind of looks off as if to say, oh, I regret that I didn't do anything. My children won't be proud of me. So they, they definitely up the ante as far as the guilt and revenge factors are concerned. Um, the, the 1917 is important for a number of reasons, as I stated before. Um, of course, the biggest one being the, uh, the conscription crisis, uh, which is most prominent in Quebec, of course, where there's, uh, there's actually rioting. And in fact, uh, some protesters are actually shot dead by police, including a, a young boy. Um, there's also the, the growing agitation for women's suffrage at that point as well. And we'll see the two uh, converge. The government under Borden uh, devises a, uh, I'd say a rather sneaky but very effective strategic plan when announcing an election, which is essentially a referendum on conscription because of course he ran originally promising no conscription and right. once he visited the battlefields of France and returned he felt he had an obligation to the men there to uh, to bolster their ranks. Um, he, the, we, in order to vote in 1917 uh, he made it uh, possible for the first time ever for men serving overseas to actually cast a ballot. Of course right. you a soldier fighting overseas um, ask him if he thinks other guys should be fighting, he's going to say yes. Um, also, uh, women who have uh, family fighting at the front are also given the vote. So they're the first women who are actually given the opportunity of uh, having universal suffrage, not out of any sort of feeling of, of equality on the government's behalf, but because he, the government knew that, of course, mothers and wives of men fighting overseas are going to want the guy next door who's you know having a nice you know cigarette on his front porch every morning he's going to want she's going to want him to go over as well and then of course finally uh, certain uh, certain citizens and, and immigrants are classified as enemy aliens and are having their voting rights taken away from them so all these uh, kind of uh, changes to the election act does lead to the mandate that Borden is looking for and the uh, military services act is subsequently being passed which then leads to the riots in Montreal and uh, and resistance elsewhere. Um, it was uh, left-leaning uh, Canadians. Uh, the Communist Party was enjoying a, a certain amount of growing uh, popularity at the time, and, and certainly many communists and other left-leaning uh, people in the country were opposed to the war. And also farmers, uh, believe it or not, were, um, were concerned about labor shortages. Right. They were making a, a lot of money th through the war, providing foodstuffs and whatnot. And they were, uh, they, were t they were kind of faced with this positive negative. They're getting a lot of work, but they don't have anyone to work the fields. And so they're also agitating right. for, for volunteerism and whatnot. So the, 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 the way that the recruitment changes, it impacts on pain society. So now all of a sudden, rather than everybody saying, you know, rule Britannia, we're saying, um, I'm more patriotic than you are, and you're just helping the Kaiser. You know, you're, what are you, or, or a bigger insult in Ontario, what are you, Quebecois? You know, because to be Quebecois in Ontario, you're pretty much were um, a supporter of the Kaiser in the eyes of some of the more orange people in this province. Uh, you know, a segue from, from this part of our discussion into the home front itself, if you would. I mean, we, we've got elements, uh, you know, as the war continues on, the, the patriotism leads, uh, uh, kind of gives way to a conscription. Um, you have the emergence of, uh, of uh, the suffrage movement uh, and uh, 
uh, selective uh, enfranchisement for women uh, leading into into the, into the vote. Um, but you know, right from the outset of the war, uh, again, perhaps beginning with patriotism, but then you know, as the war progresses, how that duty is interpreted. But um, how do you how do you view the kind of the the measures at home? Uh, is, in support of the war effort overseas, because that's always a fascinating topic. Uh, there's a, a famous line uh, from a song called The Pittance of Time that uh, uh, there's a price to be paid if you go, if you stay. Freedom's fought for and won in numerous ways. Um, can you share with us kind of, kind of your insights on the home front and, uh, and some of the, the, the things that happened here in support of the war? Definitely, and um, it's timely. Again, um, I've heard more than a few times people evoking those days of citizen sacrifice. You know, when you hear about people refusing to wear masks today during the COVID pandemic, you think about the sacrifices that uh, people on the home front made during the war, and certainly they did. Um, of course, rationing was in full effect. So, you know, you had a limited number of uh, foodstuffs which you were able to uh, provide for your family. Uh, there was a, um, uh, a, there was an expectation that you would uh, chip in for um, buying victory bonds that would uh, enable the government to be able to properly equip its armies. Uh, so, you know, a, a loyal citizen would be buying victory bonds. A loyal citizen wouldn't be uh, buying food or, or anything else on the black market. They certainly wouldn't be hoarding. Um, these are, these are expectations. And, you know, to do any of these things would be seen to be criminal uh, in the same level as someone stealing from a store. I mean, it was, it was regarded as that unpatriotic and that criminal. Um, it, it, so, I mean, I always like to look at the, the, the faces uh, of, the, of the families left behind. So you've got a mother. Uh, her, her husband is off fighting overseas. She may or may not have other family supports, but she will have about, you know, three, four children and their mouths to feed. Uh, they may or may not be of, of working age. So she has to struggle to keep the home front down, to set, to, you know, keep the house running, to feed the family, and all the time worrying about the fate of her, of her husband overseas. I mean, that would be such mental anxiety that I couldn't imagine it today. Um, even young children uh, were tasked with collecting rubber boots and old tires, rubber tires, you know, to recycle rubber for the war effort, or tin cans, tin pots going on recycling drives. Um, all these sorts of things were, were expectations of children as well. Um, so there was definitely, there were deprivations uh, for sure, but there were also expectations of, of how we could support the men at the front. You know, every time you ask for a second, it's kind of like that food is coming out of the mouth of the soldier. And that's how you were, that's how you were scolded at the table when you dare ask your mom for another bowl of soup. Right. Yeah. Well, you've also got, I mean, we have um, uh, stories that we've collected and, uh, you know, there's a, a family from uh, the Lakeview area, I believe, and, uh, you know, a father and five sons all served. Like you, you talk about the, you know, the, 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 the Oh, yeah, the, the giving or the patriotism of one family, but the angst for those left behind. Could you think of the mother? She's not only got her husband overseas, but all five of her sons. I mean, like you, you just the, the unknown factor of you know who's coming home and uh, you know the challenge they're in. And just in, the, in that story, in a brief, uh, the father was killed in action, but all five sons returned. Uh, so I mean, you, you've got these 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 incredible stories of. You know, life on the home front, but that constant stress of what's happening overseas is beyond your control um, and, and how it affects families at home. Uh, we see stories from the First World War of, you know, notices of the dead posted on the band shells and the band shells cease to become a place of music and revelry, but become a place of mourning. Um, and uh, yeah, it just the impact. And what about some of the kind of the social aid organizations? Yeah, I mean, I've I've read stories. You know, ladies' aid associations, church, uh, ladies' church groups, uh, kind of the knitting, the socks, the mail packages. You know, that kind of thing. How how do you approach those? Like, what what? what uh... Uh, and also the Salvation Army and uh, the various benevolent societies like the Belgian Relief Fund and whatnot. Um, how do I approach those? Well, again, I, I look at those as, as part of the whole citizenship piece. Uh, so in, 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 in discussing, you know, a war isn't just about the, the, the people fighting at the front. A, a war is about everybody involved. And, and, and the families that are left behind are, are very much a part of that. And um, um, 
I don't know. I, 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 I have, I'll tell you one little neat project that we have done. We have built, we have put together uh, aid kit, um, f- uh, what's it called? Red Cross uh, relief kits. Okay. Yeah. So we've done the whole kind of theorizing, okay, what would we put in this? What would it be? So, you know, students didn't knit the socks themselves, but we kind of, they created these, these little shoe boxes with socks, with chocolate, with, um, you know, not real tobacco, but something that would pass as, as cigarettes and uh, toothbrush. And, and so the assignment was basically to go research, you know, what it is that a, a, would make someone's day overseas. If you were trying to give comfort to someone who was uh, sleeping in a cold, muddy ditch with bodies all around. And so they do the research and they do, we have the discussions and then they put together this, this little shoe box, this care kit. And, um, and, I find it a really good way of, of having them learn to empathize with the soldiers. That's one of the ways we do that. Yep. We do that prior to examining actually the lives of individual soldiers. Each of my students adopt a soldier who served um, in Mississauga or surrounding areas and they get to learn about the person and uh, they eventually will, once they've com- pr- compiled a biography, they will write several letters, one being from the soldier uh, writing home and then one of the family returning the letter. So it gives oh. the, the students a real great opportunity to immerse themselves in all aspects of the war, whether it's supporting the home front with the shoe boxes or the soldier fighting at the front. Just trying to develop empathy is, is, uh, is it's a challenge, but it's, I think it's so important that we're not just looking at the bombs going off and the types of rifles being used in the battles. And, you know, without having to glorify the war, uh, paying respect to those who fought and those who supported. How, how just in that, uh, I, w- I was going to lead in that direction uh, on my next question anyway, so thank you for the, the nice bridge there. Um, but examining the life of the soldier, you, 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 you take what is, what is largely a, from a historic Mississauga perspective, but indeed a, a good portion of Canadian society is, uh, is quite rural at this time. Um, and so you're taking someone from a rural entity or even those that came, you know, come from the city of Toronto or Montreal and others that, you know, kind of the average Canadian, you know, the, the soldiers are generally around between 23 and 24 years of age on average. There are older, of course, and there are those, we have stories of lying about their age to enlist as well. But um, uh, you, t- you take them from kind of their, their regular walks of life and you, you put a uniform on them. They go through Velcarche, Quebec, they find themselves, you know, uh, traveling over the Atlantic into, into London and ultimately into France and Belgium and in the trenches. Like, how, how do you examine the, the life uh, of, and time? And how do you uh, explore that, uh, that evolution of, uh, of an individual with, with your students? Like, uh, do you use examples of, of primary source material? And uh, We do. We yeah. use primary source material as well. Like, um, again, using a, a, a farm boy or, or some someone who's worked in the mills in, in Streetsville and imagining them first of all thinking okay there's got to be more to life than this and saying you know I'm going to go for some adventure I want to go to Paris I want to see the Can Can girls I mean I'm that's how I'm kind of dramatizing the the uh, the excitement of the of the men who are going off to fight um, we 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 how do I do that um, well I asked them you know how are they how can they imagine themselves, pick a place in the world they've never been to before, that they've maybe seen images on television, they've seen movies, they read books. Imagine yourself now getting up and going there and not knowing if you're ever going to come back. Now imagine people shooting at you. Imagine not being familiar with the language. Imagine the climate. And then you start looking at the hardships. And, and then uh, the whole time you're supposed to be doing a job. Uh, I asked them a lot of the questions about what's going to keep them focused what's going to keep them alive in their minds. And uh, again, it's all about building empathy. Um, I, I even have a, a, a piece where I talk about, you mentioned Val Carche, I talk about Salisbury Plains. Right. And um, the fact that, you know, there were actually Canadian casualties and deaths prior to even setting, yeah. setting off for France, dying of pneumonia, because the conditions were abhorrent, mud up to your knees and uh, driving freezing rain. And these men were sleeping outside, you know, during this training in England. So, um, I, you know, I, we look at actual cases, again, to answer your question. And um, I try to illustrate the, the kind of steps and the conditions. And I ask them to imagine putting themselves as far out of their comfort zone as possible, to imagine being these, these guys and these younger guys. Um, and, and 
I, I think generally the students understand. Um, they're not going to be able to 100% appreciate yeah. it, but neither am I. I never, you know, I never served there. So, uh, one of, one of the things that uh, strikes me um, when we when we look at the First World War, in a way, we can be kind of clinical at it and and look at you know names and dates and service records and then like, but remembering the environment at the time that these 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 soldiers are finding themselves in and not only are they in trenches they're in harm's way they you know they're they're shooting and being shot at and you know they're following orders in some cases to disastrous results uh they're being asked to do incredibly courageous things they're covered in lights they're freezing cold they've got holes in their boots yep but I was going to say the weather was atrocious. I mean, yeah. we had. I think uh, one of the things was uh, what was it? Uh, Nineteen sixteen had most the most rain on the calendar, or something like that. Like that, the, there was uh, stories of mud that was so deep that it would not only swallow a man but the horse he was riding. <laughs> it's, uh, well, you know, the, the interesting the, the little bits of, of information that I, I kind of sprinkle into my my lessons on the greater well, on the battles and whatnot are the things that most generally grab the students' attention. So, for one, um, I you know. War movies have always been fairly popular, and you know we've had a couple, you know, relatively well-known uh, World War One movies come out recently. Um, and I asked them, I said, you know, you're you're you kind of you're in you. How do you envision a World War One battle? And they say you know, trenches and lots of mud and lots of rain. And and I say, yeah, that that was true in some instances, but France and Belgium are no wetter than yeah. we are here. Um, I said, in fact, it's it's a worse circumstance than just having it rain all the time. These were largely um, farm fields, right. fields that have been farmed for, in some cases, a millennia. When the war began, the um, uh, irrigation systems were either deliberately vandalized by the Germans, um, or they were destroyed by by bombardment. So the the flooding that occurred uh, was immense. And, and that added, to, so you didn't even have to have rain. Right. Uh, that added to the, uh, probably the worst killer in the war, which is, you know, bacterial infection. You know, they were, these fields, as I say before, were fertilized with uh, animal manure and human manure for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, in the mud, that just becomes a, a rather toxic soup you need no more than cut your finger with a, a knife or on a piece of barbed wire that could get infected it can go gangrene and you can die and um so those are the little interesting little tidbits that i like to bring in that uh, they don't really contemplate i don't think very many people contemplate that and i don't think we contemplate either things like uh you know the, the the nursing supports, the medical supports, the casualty clearing stations, like all that infrastructure that supports soldiers being active and the results of them being active. I mean, that's a whole other aspect of things too of, of dealing with the casualties. Uh, and there's a Canadian involvement with that as well. No, absolutely. Uh, it's one of the themes uh, throughout the actual uh, core grade ten course. Um, the role of women in Canadian society is a theme, uh, as is the role of immigrants and whatnot and Indigenous people. So I, I also, you know, we, we speak about uh, uh, Francis Pegamagabu, for instance, and um, his success as a sniper in the uh, Canadian Expeditionary Forces. And we also talk about the role of women um, in the home front, working in the farms, working in the factories and whatnot. But we also talk about women at the front. Like you said, not just as nurses in clearing stations and in, in frontline clearing stations, quite close. I mean, there were casualties amongst the nurses as well. Right. But even um, ambulance drivers. And um, it's just incredible. It, it's amazing to think of an 18-year-old young woman uh, in this, you know, 1914 Ford or whatever vehicle they have, automatic nothing, you know, no power brakes, no power, you know, having to, to, to maneuver over a bumpy, bombed out road with shells going off and men screaming in the back. You know, she's got a lot to uh, responsibilities and she's got to maneuver this beast and she's the mechanic. She's the one who has to be the one to fix the engine if it breaks down. I mean, it shatters all of our, our misconceptions about women being uh, unable to function in a war zone or even as, a, in this case, as a driver and a mechanic. They had to do all of this. You talk about coming of age under fire, literally. It's, it's, it's yeah. uh, uh, quite an astounding fact. 
Um, in terms of kind of a, a thematic timeline of the war itself, or a, not a thematic necessarily, but looking at the timeline of war, there's certainly high points uh, of Canadian involvement that we touch on from a history perspective. There are, you know, battles and moments within the larger picture of the war. You know, the, the names ring through history, uh, the, uh, whether you do the Somme or, uh, of course, Vimy Ridge and Passchendaele and the others. Just wondering if it, some of the ones you touch on in, in your course and uh, the, that you would consider kind of those, those, those linchpins of Canadian history. Uh, Vimy, of course, we can spend some time on as well with Canadian identity, but. Well, I start with, I actually tend to start with one that's, I guess it's it's a victory of sorts. It's a defensive victory. I start with Ypres yeah. and, um, you know, the first well-documented use of poison gas being used during the war. And I talk about Canada's role in that. And uh, so there's a, an early indication, one of several very early on that kind of, demonstrate the steel of the uh, Canadian uh, troops and their uh, their desire to do their job at all costs. I mean, they, they very early on gained that reputation, uh, one that if the Germans knew that Canadians were opposing them in the opposite trenches, that they always knew to call up for extra ammunition, uh, that they knew that the Canadians wouldn't fall back. The whole, like, the whole kind of mantra was, we won't, we won't give an inch. And, and they very rarely did in any of the battles, including their losses. But of course, when you look at the victories, such as at Vimy or, um, you know, even uh, at Passchendaele is an even better example of where, uh, you know, outnumbered, outgunned, they refused to give up and they persisted and they were able to carry the day. Um, these were um, very proud moments uh, for Canadians uh, to understand that, you know, we weren't just a colonial, um, helpless colonial entity, that we were actually more than that, we were useful to the point where the British uh, general staff uh, re started to refer to Canadians and use Canadians as stormtroopers. Right. Uh, ourselves, as well as the uh, Australians, uh, we, we tend to have an affinity with the Australians in war. Um, <clears throat> we were both tasked with being the, the, at the vanguard of attacks, sort of the, the first ones in, the, the shock troops. Yeah. And um, we were um, also quite uh, favored by the British High Command uh, with regards to trench raiding. So it was an ugly job. If you're not familiar with trench raiding, it was, you know, a handful of men, six or seven men, uh, maybe uh, greased your face, stripped down to the bare minimum um, with lots of predominantly uh, silent weapons like homemade, uh, oh, they're, they're medieval weapons that they've created. Sneak across no man's land into the enemy trenches their primary goals were to cause chaos and fear and if possible to kidnap German officers and bring them back for questioning. Well, we did this really good and it was a great risk. It was, um, you know, certain death if, if we were, if the alarms went off and, and it was, it was bloody gruesome. Uh, again, uh, the images of the weapons that were used in these uh, trench raids are, are medieval. They're unbelievably medieval. And uh, so, you know, Canadian soldiers didn't, didn't necessarily um, savor the job, but when they were told to do it, they had to go and they did it, and they did it well. Right. I'm, I'm picturing, uh, uh, I, I remember one of the uh, commanding officers on viewing uh, the advance on Vimy Ridge in April of 1917 by Canadian soldiers said, you know, in those first few moments, I witnessed the birth of a nation. Um, and, and of course, you know, we are up until the spring of 1917, Canadians are fighting under British command as kind of auxiliary units that are supplementing other British units and, and whatnot. In 1917, they're reorganized as Canadian, uh, uh, four Canadian um, uh, units, uh, I can't remember the right term, battalions, I guess, uh, under Canadian command for the first time. So at Vimy Ridge, we have Canadians fighting as Canadians under Canadian command for the first time uh, and uh, achieving what really was seen as an unachievable objective um, uh, along that uh, the spring offensive. And so it just, those moments of those kind of, again, it may be patriotism a bit, but there, there's, a, there's a wider story here uh, in terms of Canadians coming into their own. Certainly. I, I mean, uh, just a, a minor correction that Vimy was predominantly Canadian, but it was an overall, the overall command was given to Lord Bing. Yeah. Uh, who was sorry. Yeah. Governor General. <laughs> I, I, kind of meant, I kind of meant field command. <laughs> no, and you're absolutely right. And of course, 
it, it's Vimy that introduces us to perhaps arguably Canada's greatest general in, uh, in General Curry, yeah. Arthur Curry. So, um, and who will continue to, um, to demonstrate uh, competent and, uh, and, and courageous leadership throughout the war. Yeah. Um, so. And also uh, under Curry, but Canadians become known for the meticulous planning as well. Um, the, the preparations that were taken for the advance on Vimy uh, is, is something that whole, um, puts Canadians in very high esteem. Uh, it's incredible to think that before this, I mean, British, um, British military theory was always uh, top down so that, um, you know, and, and, and the British Army is one of the, the last armies, to my knowledge, to hold on to this idea that they, all the information had to emanate from the top and disseminate to the bottom. Um, but midway through the war, tactics change and the realities of the field uh, make it such that it, it, now you need to have really clever, uh, really um, quick thinking uh, officers on the ground, as you say. And as power moves from the head to the, to the, the various appendages of, of the army's body, um, you start to see uh, a lot of uh, incredibly gifted Canadian strategists starting to show their, show their, their talents, as you say. Uh, absolutely. And there's, there are numerous examples of, of that meticulous planning. And it's amazing to think that even with regards to Vimy Ridge, you know, prior to the, the battle, uh, your average soldier was not equipped with a map or a compass, simple things like that. Your officer may, um, but you certainly didn't. Um, just little innovations like that allowed for very small units, you know, platoon size and even smaller, even squads, to have a lot more freedom to, uh, to react much quicker to events happening on the battlefield. Up until that point, a lot of problems were caused by the, the, the lag time in when it, in inf information was communicated to the point that it reached uh, high command. And then, you know, by the time the answer was given, the situation on the ground changed. Right. So that was no longer a feasible uh, method of, a t of, of warfare. And that had to change. And Canadians really, again, rose to the occasion. Do you, do you examine how um, Canadian successes and perhaps even Canadian losses are received at home, uh, of how it impacts the war effort at home? Because there has to be that interplay. New, news, news may have traveled slowly, but news still traveled. Um, and yeah. that, um, I, well, I mean, it, it was greeted, greeted well. I mean, I, I don't think that there was much... Uh, I don't know how savvy the public was regarding propaganda. Certainly, um, you know, while many nations had a quote unquote free press, there was a certain uh, amount of censorship that was, that was in play. And while Canadian reporting tended to be fairly accurate, it always had a positive spin as, as you can imagine. And uh, Canadians did revel in these battles that they became legendary during these battles. I mean, soon after these battles, I should say. I mean, it wasn't that history turned these soldiers into heroes. It was happening kind of live, you know, in right. the moment. And you had, you had some really, you know, some pretty uh, creative writers and journalists who, you know, created entire stories uh, of these events. I mean, there was a different age in journalism. I mean, you had your broadsheets, which were just the facts, but you had some pretty in-depth pieces of um, whether it's composites of soldiers' experiences or whatnot, being written in Canadian publications and magazines and period, whatever, and, and then coming back to, uh, and then being very, very well received by the public. We also have, I mean, there, there are moments that happen at home. And there, there's, uh, I, it's a censorship of sorts. It, it, it's almost a, you know, keep the positive news, news flowing, but, you know, quieten the, 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 the sadder stuff in, in the process of, of the war effort. You have moments that we resonate with as Canadians, uh, you know, things like uh, the, the Halifax explosion, the uh, sinking of the, uh, of the, the Empress of Ireland, um, even the Lusitania uh, off the coast of Ireland. Uh, I mean, all of these things have connections back here at home and particularly in uh, also to historic Mississauga. But uh, from a news perspective, uh, they are, are, although they're known, they're not really explored necessarily. And, and that, uh, so you, you have the news, uh, you know, whether it was a, a direct uh, um, action uh, or, you know, the gifted uh, news, like you said, it's a news of a different time. Um, the, the gifted writers who are crafting these stories of, uh, of patriotism and heroism 
um, and uh, and the public is embracing that. I mean, we we see things in the port credit. Uh, uh, in local newspapers, sorry, that you know, explore and follow the careers of certain soldiers, um, local soldiers, and, and they're, they're fascinating to read because these are the sons of these these places, and and uh, they are, if you, lack of a better word, they're walking with them, um, and and that's a fascinating element of, of, of local history. Um, well, one of the fascinating things we have locally, and um, uh, it's a it's a famous picture, but there, uh, and we'll show it here. It's uh, called the Return Man's Parade in uh, August of 1919, and their uh, returning soldiers are parading across Lakeshore Road, and they're uh, officially demobilized at a, a garden party at the Harborland Estate uh, near where uh, Brookner Road and Gardens is today. Um, and uh, the uh, uh, it just it's a fascinating uh, element, but again, it begs more of a conversation because it's August of 1919. Um, you know, what took so long in a sense? So some people think, well, the, the, the peace was signed in uh, November of, of 1918. Well, no, that's the armistice. It resonates with me that you, you have them, your students, research a soldier from Historic Mississauga um, and write letters and, and, you know, have a correspondence with that. I, I just think that that's such an amazing way to connect to the story of this place, the story of, you know, our boys and, and yes, indeed, some of our women as well who went overseas as nurses, uh, with the Canadian nursing sisters, um, but just a, an, an amazing story. And I think uh, it, it's so fascinating that you help bring it to life in the way that you do. Um, and I know many other history teachers as well. Um, but, uh, you know, thank you for that. And, uh, um, and just you know, thank you for spending the time with us here and exploring the topics of the First World War and uh, really appreciate your enthusiasm and your knowledge of the subject and uh, My have you back on down the road. <laughs> yes, and I promise I will load up on caffeine prior to this interview, so I'll be a little more sharp. I may have well, and and uh, best of luck with the return to school, which I know is imminent for you. So yes. it's, uh, uh, be well and thank you for spending time with us. Thank you very much, Matthew. Well, joining us this week on Ask a Historian, uh, back once again is uh, is Richard Collins, joining us from Ottawa. But for many of you who've known Richard over the years, uh, a past president of the Mississauga South Historical Society, a former interpreter at the museums of Mississauga, uh, Port Credit Walking Tours, uh, Jane's Walk. I can go on and on, Richard. You've been mm -hmm. involved for many years in in Mississauga, and uh, uh, frankly, we miss you and uh, and hope you're well uh, up at our nation's capital. But uh, this week on uh, Ask a Historian, uh, we have a couple of questions which uh, I thought were well suited to, uh, to Richard's knowledge of Historic Mississauga and the First World War. And the, the first question here is from William, and uh, uh, it's uh, asking about the uh, Lakeview Aerodrome and uh, the pilots therein and, and uh, the legend, if you will, of William Faulkner was actually trained there. So uh, Richard, uh, on the uh, welcome and uh, on to our question about the, uh, the, uh, the former Long Branch Aerodrome, which was located in Lakeview in, in the city of Mississauga. So on to you. Yes, uh, it frustrates me when people call it the Long Branch Aerodrome. I guess it was called that. Uh, when I was at the War Museum here in Ottawa recently, uh, before COVID and I was taking a tour around and someone was talking about the Long Branch Aerodrome and they were going to make changes to the practices. If you're making changes, can you change the aerodrome location from being in Toronto to being in Mississauga? I don't know whether they made that change yet, but I said, no, the Long Branch Aerodrome is not in Toronto. It's in <laughs> Mississauga. Uh, of course, records will say it's in Toronto Township. Right. And that's what confuses people. But yeah, it's entirely inside Lakeview. Uh, so it's our aerodrome. And it was opened in 1915 uh, by the Curtis School, uh, which was building their own Curtis planes, originally intended to be just for private people that had lots of money and thought maybe flying would be a hobby that they could really get involved in. And so they opened the school thinking rich people might want to learn to fly planes. Of course, as the war started, they thought our real market is in training young men who uh, will you know, hopefully be I hired by the Royal Naval Air Service or by the Royal Flying Corps, and they can see some excitement in action uh, flying over France and Belgium. And so for two years, it was run by the Curtis School. Glenn Curtis had been building biplanes uh, in the U.S. and decided he wanted to market them in Canada, along with uh, a gentleman that had lots of money at the time and could help prop up his company, a guy you might know by the name of Sir Alexander Graham Bell. The guy we think of as the man who invented the phone, which he did, 
but was also very much involved in heavier than air aircraft flight, even more than he was into the telephone. He really loved uh, planes, so he got involved in this company. And then they hired as a manager, uh, J.A.D. McCurdy, John McCurdy, who was the first person in the entire British Empire, not just in Canada. The Canadians had a man in the year before the British. So that was one for the colonies. And that was J.D. McCurdy. And he flew the Silver Dart in 1909. Well known. So he came to manage the, uh, uh, the Curtis Flying School at Long Branch in 1915. And as the war kind of picked up, the government realized we need to take this over so we can train more people. It was transferred in 1917 to the Royal Flying Corps. And then they managed it for the until the end of the war. Although, unfortunately, when the RFC took over, they had bigger plans. They found the aerodrome was kind of a little bit cramped where it was. Wind conditions were pretty rough on Lake Ontario, a little bit too rough for trainees. They ended up moving most of the trainees up to what is now CFD Borden, a major Canadian forces base up there. And so it didn't last long after that kind of thinned out. Uh, and that's the short history on the, uh, on the aerodrome itself. Some 500 pilots uh, between the school and the RFC uh, graduated. And one of the last of those uh, technically wasn't a graduate, was a young William Falkner. And I'm not mispronouncing that name. He was born F-A-L-K-N-E-R. And I have a book here I want to show you. You can buy. Can you see oh, that? Oh, yes. There? Okay. I can check it online. I got this from one of the volunteers at the, at the Bradley Museum, uh, Mary Lyons, years ago. You can find it online at uh, Amazon.ca. It's called, I guess I should read it out, uh, Thinking of Home, William Faulkner's Letters Home to His Mother and Father, 1918 to 1925. So he's a young kid who had never left Mississippi until April of that year, and a couple letters from New Haven, I guess he was going to Yale. Uh, so he'd never left home, and by July of that same year, here he is in Canada, wanting to be a flyer, thinking it's gonna be really exciting, and I'm writing all this to his mother, uh, and he wasn't too sure he'd get in because he was an American, so he specifically changed his name from Falkner to Faulkner. You see it in his letters. His uh, first chapter is all F to, to Mrs. M.C. Falkner, F-A-L-K-N-E-R, and then by the time he gets to Long Branch, and the letters are postage stamped Long Branch, uh, they have changed to F-A-U-L-K-N-E-R because he thought the U made the, his name look more British. And he thought, I'll get in with the Royal Naval Air Service, more likely if I look like I'm British. Apparently, the story goes, he put on a, a bit of a British accent, too, that he wasn't very good at. It was a little bit obvious. And I think he realized after a while he didn't need it. And so he started in July of 1918, and it was a six-month course. Uh, a lot of the training took place in a school in Toronto where they did their navigation. But he got up in the air flying over Mississauga. Uh, and then, unfortunately for him... Uh, the Treaty of Versailles is signed in November of 1918. The war ends, and the RFC is ready to uh, just close everything down. Uh, and they just more or less tell these last graduates, including uh, William Faulkner, we don't need you no more. So he never graduated, but not really his own fault. Everyone in his class was discharged in November, uh, and it wasn't supposed to be over till December. So yes, William Faulkner really lived in Mississauga and trained in Mississauga. Uh, for about five months. Fascinating elements when we look at the, kind of the, the picture of the who's who have wandered through uh, through historic Mississauga. And just from yeah. the location, we, we, we mentioned that the aerodrome was located in Mississauga. From uh, those who are wondering about it, uh, on the south side of Lakeshore Road, uh, uh, just to the uh, west of Dixie Road uh, is the location of, uh, of the aerodrome. Not too far from, uh, for those who are, uh, remember the, or, or know what is the former small arms facility, a little bit to the, uh, to the west of that. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and there is a plaque. Yes. Uh, it doesn't really correspond to any street, uh, uh, but when you're walking along the walking trail, great bicycle trails along the waterfront trail. One thing I miss about Mississauga, you got great waterfront trails there. Uh, and as the waterfront trail comes back up to Lake Shore Road, uh, um, close to Dixie, but again, west of Dixie, you'll see a plaque there that definitely identifies it as the first aerodrome in Canada. A bit of a dispute with a bunch of people in Montreal who want to think that there was a, a grass field in Carcheville, which is the north part of the island of Montreal, which apparently had been, had been laid out before the aerodrome, uh, but no planes had actually ever landed there. <laughs> Someone was, and they had one air show, and there was, a, there was a number of air shows that took place before 1915, 
uh, uh, but the, yeah, the first one that was actually planned as an aerodrome and had ang angers and facilities specifically for landing plane uh, is pretty much now acknowledged to be Long Branch or Lakeview. Lakeview. Um, <laughs> and I, I think one of the fascinating elements too, and I know we just touched on it and uh, perhaps in another episode we could expand on it more, but is the association with J.D. McCurdy um, and yeah. uh, you know that, that the actual training system of the school and, and what it meant to the pilots who were uh, being trained for, as you said, the Royal Naval Air Service or the Royal Flying Corps. These were pilots who were from Canada, who were trained in Canada, at least at the beginning of their careers, sent overseas, and then flew uh, with the with the British services. Um, yeah, and there was no Canadian Air Force at the time. No Canadian, yeah. And, uh, yeah, and then the Royal Air Force, the RAF that we think of now, was founded after the war when the RNES and the RFC merged into the yep. RN. Yep. Uh, one of the fascinating things, and we'll show a picture of it here, was... <laughs> The plane that they flew uh, is the famed uh, JN3, the Jenny, the Curtis Jenny, uh, was one of the, the famous aircraft of, of the time, and that was the plane that uh, quite that often... That was the JN4. The JN3 oh, was JN4, the first. Sorry, JN4. I, the only reason I bring that up is because apparently the pilots hated the JN3. Oh, did they? <laughs> but they kept offering suggestions. A lot of this took place in Long Branch, because there was a factory on, on Strawn Avenue in Toronto yeah. where they were making them, and so the pilots were giving their input as, do this, do that. And they incorporated those changes into the JN4. Okay. And then the, the JN4 was so beloved by pilots, that's why they called them Jenny. The did. Jenny, yeah, okay. And there was also something known as the Flying Boat, uh, which is a amphibious landing aircraft. Uh, that Yeah, they were tested, from what I understand, mostly out of uh, Hamlin's. Hamlin, yeah, Toronto Island, Island yeah. Uh, but a similar origin in terms of the school and the training program and, and yep. the like. But uh, just a fascinating, albeit short-lived, uh, program here in Historic Mississauga. Mm -hmm. Like I said, about 500 pilots trained through the program. I think somewhere we've written down about 170 graduates. Uh, so not every pilot that took the program ended up uh, overseas. But uh, I just, think 170 was for the uh, was for the Curtis Training School or or uh, or the RFC. I can't remember. Right. But I know the numbers I got. The, the, the reason the one number doesn't correspond to the others is because they kept separate records for the what RFC graduated and what yeah. Curtis School graduated. It, apparently, it's closer to 500 when you get okay. them well, that's, both added together. That, that's a fascinating element. And again, both short-lived. I mean, both schools ran for, what, about uh, a year years. and a half each, yeah. uh, something like that? Yeah, and then uh, by 1918, as soon as the war was done, yeah. yeah, the government just, you know, was had spent so much money on the war that they closed things down as quickly as they could. Yeah. Most of them became private fields, so it's interesting that Long Branch is one of the few that never really stayed on as an airport. A yeah. little bit too close to some urban development along Toronto, particularly, was growing at the time. Uh, but yeah, you'll find RFC fields all over. There's one in Beamsville where the uh, hangar still stands. Uh, eventually, what became CFB Trenton, which is still in service, just, and yeah, Borden. So there's still lots of them around. Well, uh, thank you for that. Uh, you're uh, a wealth of knowledge when it comes to to that aspect of our history, and uh, really appreciate you sharing it with us. And like I said, maybe we'll have a maybe someone will, will bite on the suggestion and you send us a question about JED McCurdy, and we can uh, revisit that another uh, another time. Uh, our second question uh, this week uh, uh, revolves around the home front um, and uh, uh, asking about uh, what happened on the home front uh, here in historic Mississauga during the war, specifically about social groups uh, and, and what kind of things, was there rationing in the social groups that supported the war? Just wondering if you can expand on that. I know you've talked about that in the past. So just uh, the idea of what's happening at home uh, during the First World War. Yeah, we used to talk a lot about this when I was a, a historical interpreter at Benares because it's a great old house going back to 1837, uh, but it was restored to the 1918 period because there was great stories to be told about uh, Canada during the home front. Uh, it was also the first home in the area just before the war to get electricity and uh, central heating, the first flush toilet in all of Mississauga. And so it was a great time to restore the house to. And so uh, it's, it was a neat place to tell stories about what life was like in Canada at the time. And as far as I can tell by going through old newspapers, the Toronto Star, the Streets Will Review, uh, papers like that, is that there was no real formal rationing during the First World War. In the Second War, it was all organized uh, under uh, Department of Munitions and Supplies and people were given 
ration stamp books. So they could only buy, they had to pay using the stamps to limit the amount of wheat, well, wheat, meat, and heat is what they used to say, or the three that you had to meet, uh, cost about because they needed food, obviously, to supply the soldiers. Uh, they didn't want you using gasoline, uh, driving your car around during the Second War because the way the planes, the tanks, the, uh, the Allied forces really needed that. So there was a definite effort to control the amount of necessary war material that was used by the public. In the first war, it was more uh, newspaper advertisements in the streets for real, kind of encouraging people, think of the boys overseas, uh, yeah, don't eat a lot of wheat, uh, replace it with, we used to make it uh, at Benares in the Bay Covenant, so we would make something called victory bread, really awful dry bread. Uh, you only used about two thirds the amount of wheat that you would normally use, supplement it with potatoes or something Potatoes were too heavy to be shipping over, uh, so that wasn't an important part of the soldier's diet. So, yeah, you could use things like that, and you'd make victory bread, which might have tasted better if you were to put some butter on it, uh, but you weren't allowed to use butter <laughs> or discouraged from using butter. Again, it wasn't rationed, uh, but butter was something that could be sent over uh, to the soldiers. Uh, yeah, so no formal rationing, but a lot of guilt trips to encourage people. Uh, one little poster that we keep at the at Benares, uh, which was a kind of guilting the servants because the Harris's had a servant and suggested that, you know, at the end of every meal, if there are breadcrumbs left over, sweep up the breadcrumbs and keep them. And after the week, you might have enough crumbs, enough to make a bread pudding or something, which is like a, an additional meal. And it's one meal of the week that saves consumption of more bread and more wheat that go to the soldiers. Yeah, so no real rationing first war. That wasn't until the second. What about uh, some of the, the aid organizations? Uh, women's groups, uh, women's institutes? Uh, yeah, the Women's Institute definitely. Uh, at the time, fortunately, we got a lot of the minutes that are part of the Benares collection because Annie Harris was the president of the uh, Clarks and Lauren Park Women's Institute at the time. And certainly, I'm, I'm sure you'd find records for Streetsville and Carson and Moulton. Uh, at the time, but yeah, they definitely talked about what they would do is, uh, is they would get to uh, knitting meetings together, uh, where at first I thought, well, they'd be knitting socks and scarves, which they could do for the soldiers, because these weren't things that were supplied necessarily by the CEF, the Canadian Expeditionary Force. These were things that you kind of hoped you'd get from home. Uh, but mostly what they would make is they would get the, the artificial plans that were sent to women's institutes by the Canadian Red Cross describing the dimensions and the size and length of, of bandages and cloth uh, that would be in standard rolls and rolled up to a certain size so they could be shipped over. So a lot of the ladies spent uh, most of the war uh, making bandages and uh, slings and things like that for the Red Cross that they shipped over. Uh, we have a couple photographs. In fact, I've, I've seen them in, in, in your collection, the Heritage Mississauga collection uh, of... Uh, soldiers getting off the trains because the trains uh, that were coming from all over southwestern Ontario, they would stop in Toronto on their way to Valcarche, where all the soldiers met and were shipped over, Valcarche being North Quebec City, uh, where they were shipped over to, to Europe. And uh, there was a rest stop in Clarkson for the soldiers to get out and stretch their legs. And the ladies of the Clarkson Lauren Park Women's Institute would be there to give them pies and coffee. Uh, one time there was a, a case of the 72nd Regiment coming in from Hamilton that marched to Toronto. Can you imagine going to war and even before you get to the bloody muddy trenches of France and Belgium, you're walking from Hamilton to Toronto, marching, uh, and they got attacked in Lorne Park. The 72nd Regiment was attacked, not by Germans, uh, but by, it was planned ahead, but by residents in Lorne Park uh, that were told in advance, see if you can surprise the troops. I found it hard to believe, but there are newspaper articles in the Streets for Review and the Toronto Star that confirm that every now and then citizens were even encouraged <laughs> to it. And uh, so Lauren Park, they attacked. Uh, and then, yeah, a few miles down the road, they were given coffee and pie by the Port Credit Women's Institute. So I think I like Port Credit more than Lauren Park. I, I think we should expand on the attack part. It was attacked by apples, I believe, were the-, the Oh, was it okay? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I believe the newspaper count, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, Richard, because you, I mean, you shared this with me originally, was uh, surprised by the, the boys in the ditches jumping up and throwing apples at them, and the, and the soldiers quickly returned fire. <laughs> that was yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> so, you so, think so, yes, the first world war, there was an apple fight on Lakeshore Road. That was the... Yeah, uh, how about that? Yeah, apple pies and Clarkson, then an apple fight 
uh, in Lawrence Park down the road, and then tea and coffee in Port Credit. So they were treated well. Uh, and even Jeffrey, who was uh, Jeffrey Sayers, who was one of the three people that donated Benares uh, after their aunt Naomi died. Uh, and we do have letters that the family saved of him raising money as a kid going door to door to raise money for something that was called the Serbian Relief Fund. Uh, because keep in mind that the Germans were fighting a war on the Western Front against Britain, France, Canada, the United States. You know? yeah. But they were also fighting a war against uh, uh, the Slavic nations, Turkey, and places like that. So they had two fronts. And uh, because those areas on the Eastern Front were quite destitute, uh, because the British, or the, rather the Germans, were burning their fields, trying to drive them into starvation, there was a big movement amongst young people in Canada to raise money uh, for Serbian relief. Uh, and there's uh, also posters we have uh, where a lot of young people would become uh, soldiers of the soil. Get young kids out there now that they're, if people have farms. It's a lot of farms, even in Mississauga, folks. Imagine Mississauga being mostly farms in 1918, if you can imagine that. Yep. Uh, and these young boys being sent over to Europe to fight, like 18 to you know, 25 being sent to fight. And so they're looking for 8, 10, 12-year-old kids uh, in the neighborhood that might want to help them do gardening and things like that just to help these families that are having a hard time managing their farm with their young healthy boys fighting in Europe yeah. and so Jeffrey did that as well. Uh, Dora, uh, the next younger appropriately I guess we can bring this up now, uh, she did contract the Spanish flu, we talked about that recently in Ask an Historian but uh, yeah that was the pandemic of the time uh, she survived it because she was still living uh, in her 60s when she donated the house to us. Uh, but yeah, so everyone in the, in the family was, in families all across Canada, if you weren't at the front, you were still affected by the uh, limited amount of food you could eat, uh, by uh, work that was expected of you uh, as volunteers. And yeah, and then the Spanish flu, kind of a, a big capper right near the end of the war. Well, it, it is, and, and Spanish flu, again, uh, uh, a topic that really kind of brings to a close the, the time of the First World War and, uh, you know, the impacts that it had across the world and, you know, here at home in Canada. Uh, we've had, you mentioned uh, uh, Dora uh, as part of the uh, Harris Sayers family, but then uh, we have a, a soldier, Angus Gray, who uh, at 25 years old passes away in Port Credit from the Spanish flu, likely coming home infected already. Um, and, uh, you know, stories like that that really begin to tell, and, and the newspapers tell it as well. You have the, you know, the newspapers are keeping tabs on the boys overseas, and, uh, you know, sadly, in many cases, talking about their deaths and, and how that would reverberate within the community. But those aid organizations, the, particularly the ladies' aid groups through the churches, uh, the women's institutes, really instrumental in kind of aid from home. But then you have also things like the, the Red Cross and uh, you know the Canadian Nursing Sisters and mm -hmm. others that are, are very much part of that uh, that supporting the the, the war effort. The, the war is not only fought in the trenches; it's that support system that also enables the soldiers to operate. Uh, whether or not there was formal rationing or not is, is part of that story uh, of supporting that war effort overseas. And again, we see more again in the Second World War, but. The First World mm. War, it, it was it was a total support of, of, of the war effort overseas and a, a lot of it based on patriotism and the sense of a call to duty, uh, both at home and abroad. Um, and, uh, you know, something we can be proud of in terms of this community oh, yeah, definitely. and its contributions. Uh, uh, and I know you're up there in Ottawa, you know, you're probably a stone's throw away from the, uh, the National War, Museum, war, war Memorial. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, the... Uh, the annual remembrances of service and sacrifice is something that uh, it may look a little different this year. We're, we're not quite sure how those things will will play out uh, from a public gathering perspective, but it does not. No, it's been quiet uh, this year. There's always uh, from April right till November 11th, right till the 10 o'clock changing of the century. Uh, there's always been a changing of the centuries every hour from nine till five. Uh, it's not been going on most of this year. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, first special services have been doing it uh, on a volunteer basis. You can still see it, but yeah, really quiet where it used to be a huge yeah. event draw and yeah, who knows what it's going to be like. And uh, just off to the, to the right of the National War Memorial itself is what's called the Valiance Memorial uh, where they have busts and statues of some of the notable people in Canada's military and when you got talking to the nurses, it got thinking of, of Georgina Pope 
okay. uh, who's one of the one of the women uh, that's part of this valley. The other one happens to be uh, at Port Credit Connections. It's Laura Secord. Right. Uh, but Regina Pope. Uh, yeah, by the time of the Second World War, the Women's Nursing Corps was well organized, but that's because it had been started in the First World War, war by Colonel Pope, uh, who got the women organized and got them to the point where uh, they had lower officers ranks, but nurses, you know, if they had to give soldiers orders in a hospital, they had to have a rank higher than the privates and the corporals yep. that were there. It had to be understood, yeah, they're women, but uh, they've been given a rank where they can order you around as long as you're in the hospital or uh, yeah, when, when you're not, when you're in the parade area, when you're not at battle. Yep. And yes, yeah, so she was instrumental in founding that. The other thing I like about it is there's about 14 of them uh, representing all different parts of Canada, men and women, uh, Aboriginal uh, and French and English, it's all there. But the man that leads it all at the front, has got the full statue at the front, is my particular hero of the First World War and of Canadian military in general, and that's Sir Arthur Curry. Yeah. We're talking about World War I today. i got to bring him up because I think he's... Uh, absolutely. And, and uh, you know, re really part of that, uh, that emerging Canadian identity uh, in, in the First World War. And uh, again, just to segue back to the question about the life on the home front and, and that support system on the home front, that was integral to the service overseas. And, uh, and they, they, they went hand in hand and the success of the one could not have happened without the efforts of the other. And, and Oh, yeah. Uh, they in fact, uh, someone who really reinforced that, we're moving to the Second World War, but still focusing on, on, on uh, Long Branch, uh, it was uh, C.D. Howe, who was the head of the industrialization effort in Canada and how to organize the industries to get the war materials over there. And he referred to the women that were working in Canada as the fourth service, yes. the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force being the other three. And says, they openly admitted as they're opening the small arms plant. And this was a speech that he made at the small arms plant when it opened in 1940, that yeah, the women of Canada constituted a fourth service. We wouldn't have weapons. We wouldn't have Lee Enfields and Stems and Brens to give to the soldiers in the first place had it not been for women uh, in factories all over Canada, but of course, especially in Long Branch, where the small arms plant was uh, the, the only purpose-built factories specifically to build small arms to meet the demand that other factories didn't have time for. So, yeah, another long branch connection. Incredible stories, one. incredible stories, really, oh, really. I don't want to leave them out, of course, that's another story we can talk about another day, but then, yeah, the, the train, the British Commonwealth Air Training Program that was centered out of Malton. So, yeah, well, Mississauga was uh, I, I, I love, I love, of I love dangling Canadian some board. questions. I, I said, I love dangling some questions, and hopefully somebody will ask them. You know, the yeah. Commonwealth Air Training Plan, uh, uh, you know, small arms we haven't really explored yet either, and victory yeah. aircraft and like, all with the Second World War, of course. But, uh, you know, First World War, very much connected to the, the bones of this community and, and the service they're in and those that supported the war effort overseas. And, I guess on that, I should also apologize for anyone who heard the the, uh, the laughter in the background. Uh, I'm not alone where I am, and uh, I've, got, I've got kids and trying to keep them quiet sometimes a challenge. But uh, uh, but Richard, for the that, time, yeah, it is a fun time. But Richard, uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for sharing the stories of, of Mississauga, and uh, uh, really appreciate your expertise and your time and your 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 passion for history. And uh, thank you for joining us here this week. Well, thanks for inviting me. And anytime, I still love talking about Mississauga. Love having you.